All right, well, we're getting close. We're a little after 6.30, and hopefully we've got everybody. So um, thank you all for coming tonight. And again, we're recording this, so I ask that you hold your questions until the end. Um, I see some new faces. How many people are, were not here last week? Well, we have quite a few. We may have to re-explain the double slit experiment. <laughs> that's kind of critical to a lot of it. <laughs> but as I said earlier, there's not going to be a test on this, so you don't have to worry. You won't be tested, and uh, I'll have a few more coming in. So it's not like college, you know, where you actually have to, you know, you'll pass, Dale, don't worry. I I'll give you a passing grade, Dale. <laughs> All right, well, welcome back. In the, in the last lecture, we covered a lot. Um, get this thing to work now. Um, we talked about Universe 2.0, Heaven. I introduced the concept that consciousness is non-local. By that, I mean it's not contained just between our ears. We use near-death experiences to highlight how our consciousness, our soul, leaves our body at death, an example of non-local consciousness. We discuss physics and how especially the quantum mechanics points to the non-local consciousness. And also we discuss the double slit experiment and the work of Dean Radin that also shows that consciousness is in fact fundamental to the universe. We'll expand a bit more on that tonight. It affects the elementary particles of the universe. Now hopefully if you hadn't before, you have now watched the three videos that we posted on the FOPC webpage on near-death experiences. Ian McCormick was on the morgue when Jesus said, you're going back, much like Lazarus. The one of Dr. Sicoria pointed out the savant effect. After his NDE, he began writing symphonies. This illustrates the point that our brain acts as a filter between us and God, what I called God's consciousness field. I liken it to known fields of matter, such as electromagnetism, gravity, or the Higgs field. The third was on Dr. Eben Alexander. He wrote the book, Proof of Heaven. He is the one along with others who state our brain is a filter between us and the center of knowledge and energy of the universe. That will be much of our discussion tonight. We also discussed the wave particle duality, the complementary properties of waves and particles through the double slit experiment. So as the points we kind of left it, consciousness extends beyond our ears, consciousness is fundamental to the universe, and quantum mechanics implies that the universe is not as real as we think it is. Now at the end of last week's lecture, Dory shared with us her own NDE when she was just a toddler. Dory told us how she got out of the crib, took some pills, and her mother rushed her to the hospital, and she died actually several times. Dory had an out-of-body experience. She rose up and was looking down at a body on the operating table, her own. Now, it is rude of me to disclose the age of a lady. However, Dory, in this case, it was 87 years ago. And yet she recalls the events vividly. She wasn't even, what, two years old in about that time? So as we discuss, this point this points out the research of, for one, Bruce Grayson at the University of Virginia, who's one of the leading researchers in near-death experiences. Those who experience NDEs recall the memory far more distinctly than events in our current reality. When you have a dream, you wake up and you go, that was a dream, and you forget about it fairly quickly. A year from now, you may recall that you came to the lecture, but she won't remember what I've said. You might forget about it tomorrow morning. But however, those who have NDEs, those memories occur when your consciousness has left their body, their physical body. Dory was in a different realm. And those memories are far greater. It could be that the other realm, universe 2.0 or heaven, is greater reality than what the one we are living in now. It could also be that in that realm that our physical brain is filtering a little less so those memories are retained. Whatever it is, it is, a, it is definitely different. Tonight we will discuss different ways to think about reality. 
The last lecture I stated there are two experiments that highlight the odd properties of quantum mechanics. We spoke briefly of one of the, the two, the double slit experiment. This highlighted the wave particle duality and the observer effect, conscious observation. Tonight we will begin with the second experiment that defines the quantum world and go a bit deeper into the implication. Recall the quote from we used last week from Werner Heisenberg. When one first drinks from the cup of scientific knowledge, one learns to question everything. Soon one becomes an atheist. By the time you reach the bottom of the cup, you are staring at God. That's what we hope to do tonight. The second experiment we're going to talk about is known as the EPR experiment, which stands for Einstein, Podesky, and Rosen. As you can infer, it starts with Einstein. Podesky and Rosen were two associates working with him at the time at Princeton. Perhaps a brief history of its evolution will be insightful. Back in the 1920s in Brussels, Belgium, at the Solvay Institute, each year there was a gathering of the greatest minds in science. This picture is the 1927 conference participants. The woman in the front row is Marie Curie. Of the 29 people in this picture, 17 received the Nobel Prize in physics during their careers. Now, each year, Einstein would bring some thought experiment to the Solvay conference attacking the Copenhagen interpretation of Niels Bohr. We spoke of that last week. Niels Bohr would then stay up all night coming up with an answer to refute Einstein's hypothesis. They were lifelong friends and antagonists, both equally brilliant. Now, Einstein recognized the importance of quantum mechanics. He helped start the movement in 1905, but he felt it was an incomplete theory. He didn't like that it was non-deterministic and his main issue is what he calls spooky interaction at a distance. The spooky interaction violates his special theory of relativity. Information in our universe cannot travel faster than the speed of light. So let me, we, let me explain. We'll go back to the double slit experiment. And actually, we have quite a few people here. This might be a dumb question. Those that have been here, we're here. are you familiar with the double slit experiment? Nah, I didn't think so. That was a dumb question. But that was my part, sorry. So we talked about this last week, so this will be a refresher for everybody else, and we'll go into it. So if somebody's talking out in the hallway out there, we can hear them, but we can't see them. We hear them because sound waves are about a, a meter, which is about the same wavelength as a doorway. So sound waves, or any wave, bend around an obstacle that is about the, their own equivalent of the same wavelength. So we talked about last week, we showed pictures of waves coming into a pier or something, <clears throat> and you see the waves break apart and then come back together. So the, the, the obstacle has to be close to the wavelength. So if you have uh, a series of waves, okay, if you have another wave that's in, you know, in, that they're lined up together. If you add these two waves, you get a straight line. You get zero. Or this, excuse me, this case, backwards. This case, you would double them and you get a big one, right? If the waves are offset, the waves are offset so that the peak and the trough line up. And I'm not very good drawing this. But anyway, you get the point. If the peak of the trough line up and you add them up, you get zero. Right? That's called constructive and destructive interference. Right? And so to test light, in 1801, Thomas Young did this experiment. The obstruction has to be very small. Light has a wavelength where sound is like one meter, the width of a door. Light is 10 to the minus 7 meters, 500 nanometers. So the destruction has to be very small. So we're talking really small, but we can draw it like this. This is called the double slit experiment. You have two slits, and over here you have a uniform light source. So the light comes out, you know, it goes out like this. But once the light goes through the slit, you have this diffraction pattern, right? But you have two of them. And wherever these waves intersect, 
you don't get anything. Where, where they over here, they actually double them height. So you, so you have this interference. If you took a screen here, and I'll draw the screen up here, you know, what you get is where they, where the, you get this, a lot of you know, activity where they've doubled and you get no activity where they've zeroed themselves out. That's called the double slit experiment. The odd part is if you observe this, it becomes a particle, right? And if you have your screen here, and we shoot one, and what you can do with modern technology, if you were to fire, rather than this light beam, one particle at a time, you're shooting one particle, a photon, electron, any atom, you shoot one at a time, it hits the screen, and you get a dot, one dot. You hit it again, shoot another part, you get another dot. You got a particle, all right? You do this long enough, pretty soon you develop the exact same pattern as if you had a wave go through it. This is the wave-particle duality. So, again, how does an individual particle interfere with itself? What path did the particle take? Well, it actually could take an infinite number path. We just have two answers here. But so, the particle acts like a wave unless you observe it. If you observe it, it is a particle. Even stranger yet, so you have you know, the, the light going back through here. If let's say I have some detector here, and I want to, I want to detect which slit this particle went through. As soon as I turn that detector on, it's a particle. And even if this light source, for example, is a long ways away, and I pulsed it, and so I get a pulse of light, okay, you'd say it's a wave, and then I turn the detector on, after the light has left its source, it's a particle. It knows what you're thinking before you even turn the experiment on. It becomes a particle. Can't explain it. So, in this example, back to spooky interaction at a distance, assume for the discussion the slits are really far apart. This is just for information purposes so we can discuss it. At each slit, we put a mirrored box so the particle, you can see the particle. This is the thought experiment. And if one fires a single electron at the double slit, it acts as a wave. And it can go through both slits at the same time, we just discussed. This gets the interference pattern. However, if you observe the slit, which one the particle went through, it acts as a particle. It will be only in one slit. On my drawing here, not a very good one, one box. However, it's when you observe it. If you look for the particle, and if it's in box A, you know with 100% certainty it's not in box B. Likewise, if it's not in box A, with 100% certainty, it's in box B. How do two particles communicate instantaneously when observed to be in box A and not in box B? Information in our universe cannot be transmitted faster than the speed of light. It's this spooky interaction at a distance violates Einstein's special relativity. So, you know, in this case, the slits can be very close, but you can actually do this experiment with a very far apart. And they're in, so in 1928, again, Einstein brought another thought experiment to the Solvay conference, and no one could counter it. They couldn't come up with an answer to Einstein challenging quantum mechanics. Once again, Bohr spent all night trying to answer it. This is a crude drawing of his example of Einstein's experiment. And Bohr's answer, and this little drawing represents some complicated physics, I'll explain in a second. The counter argument to Einstein's thought experiments, he had ignored the effects of general relativity, his other theory. So, like in this box here, for example, you know, again, this is back in 1927, and it's a thought experiment, right? So you have some box with a spring so you can weigh it, and you have some magical apparatus that opens this door exactly at the right time, and say there's an electron in there. And the door opens up and the electron leaves. So you know precisely the time the electron left the box, you know its velocity, the speed of light, and you know its mass. So according to Einstein, he said, 
you know its, its position, you know its velocity, its mass, that violates Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. As you recall, last week I said if I shot an electron across this room, I would know its position, but not its velocity. I could know its velocity, but not its position. You can't know both. And so, I, in theory, Einstein thought he stumped him. Well, what Bohr came up with, when the electron left the box, the mass of the box changed. That changed the space-time. That changed the time of it, and that uncertainty was sufficient to maintain the uncertainty principle. So, as you recall, you know, a clock that's orbiting the Earth goes slower than a clock on the Earth. The space-time differential of general relativity. Mass affects time. And so that's how Bohr countered it. I suspect that Niels Bohr went home from the conference and told his wife, I have finally shut up that Einstein fellow. And he did for seven years. Then Einstein came back with the EPR experiment. Again, it was a thought experiment, but it points out a rather odd property of quantum mechanics that we now refer to as particle entanglement. The quandary could not be solved until after 1965, 30 years later, when the Irish physicist John Bell came up with a mathematical solution, one of the greatest mathematical achievements of the 20th century. And he did get a Nobel Prize. How can you tell, the diff how can you tell if there's some unknown hidden particle, we don't even know what it is, that communicates instantaneously? Bell created a mathematical inequality that could now be measured. It took another 20 years, however, before it could be tested. The experiment has been modified over the ensuing years, and originally there was no way to test it. Atomic particles have a property called spin. Similar to what you would say as a, as a spinning top, it's not quite the same, but we can think of it that way. It has to do with angular momentum. We're not going to get into great details, but essentially if you have a radiation source, so this was the EPR experiment, you have a radiation source that decays into two particles. One went one way and one went the other way, the opposite direction. They each will be described by their own wave function, but momentum has to be conserved. If you measure one particle and it's spin up, the other one has to have the opposite measurement spin down to conserve momentum. Einstein believed there was a local hidden variable that we were not aware of that describes the action, not the collapse of the wave particle duality. So to, again, I'm not gonna go into the details, but to test the experiment with today's technology, essentially have a calcite crystal and they shine a laser on it and it pops out two photons and you have these filters. And I think your sunglasses, if you have polarized lenses in your sunglasses, essentially they block out photons with a certain spin, like they may block out spin down and let spin up go for you. That's how your polarized sunglasses work. And so they actually are measuring the spin of the particle, and that is the uncertainty for the Bell's inequality. Um, okay. So to test the EPR with this technology, you shine a light and we explain all that, okay? It's gonna be spin up and spin down. The first experiment was done in 1972 at Berkeley, but it took many years to perfect it. And it showed the particles are entangled and there is no hidden variable. There were some questions on the instantaneous effects and test the apparatus, and it really wasn't until the 1990s, 60 years after Einstein thought about it, that the experiment was run in the 1990s and unequivocally demonstrated that there was in fact spooky interaction at a distance, which is actually still the best description of it. The particles are communicating instantaneously. It is spooky and we cannot explain it. How far apart can two entangled particles be and still communicate instantaneously? In theory, two particles can be on either side of the universe and be entangled, communicate instantaneously. There is no explanation. This test has been conducted with sensors that are 150 kilometers apart. Einstein was wrong and Niels Bohr was correct. To the scientific community, that was the end of it. Done, end of discussion. There is no hidden variable and we can't explain it. That's it, we're done. Thank you all for coming tonight. Or actually the question, or was Einstein correct? 
Is there something totally different about our universe in reality that we are not aware of? Well, perhaps. We will continue our discussion by talking about a little known theoretical physicist whose theory totally stretches our understanding of reality and is actually now gaining some momentum. This was David Bohm, another brilliant but little understood physicist. Again, a little history is useful. Bohm was a brilliant and deep thinker at Princeton. He had many conversations with Einstein during, and during World War II, Oppenheimer, his mentor, wanted the brilliant young scientists on the Manhattan Project. The army rejected him because while in Berkeley, he attended several Communist Party meetings in San Francisco. Some things just don't change. It's still Berkeley, all right? After the war during the McCarthy hearings, they were trying to convict a member of the San Francisco Communist Party who did in fact transmit secret information to the Russians. The FBI could not use their evidence because they had obtained it illegally or improperly, I should say. Bohm was asked to testify before Congress about this individual and he refused. He was convicted for not testifying before Congress and later the Supreme Court threw it out. In the meantime, he was denied a teaching position at Princeton and his mentor, Oppenheimer, told him he would have to leave. Bohm accepted a position at the university in Brazil. While in Brazil in 1951, he wrote a paper on what is called the pilot wave theory and quantum potential, a radical new idea. Bohm reintroduced a deterministic principle. Remember, quantum mechanics, we talked about this, is about the probabilities. It's non-deterministic. The paper was circulator. Oppenheimer at this point in time was the leading spokesman of the particle physics community. He called together a group of physicists and asked, can we respond to Bohm's theory? The answer from all of them was no. He said, ignore it. So no one wrote a paper about it, either proving it or challenging it. It was ignored and forgotten. It was really only recently emerged now as a topic of thought and study. Actually, it did inspire Bell. He actually was read it and was inspired by it. So Bell, who came up with the way to test the experiment, was, was actually inspired by Bohm's work. Bohm left Brazil and he went to the newly created state of Israel. He was Jewish and he eventually took a position at a university in London. It was not until computers had advanced enough, I can't recall, it was in the late 70s, 80s, that his students and colleagues could actually do the complicated math of his pilot wave theory. You know, he developed it 25 years before. They needed powerful computers. When they ran his math, they found that it ex exactly predicted the quantum behavior of a particle. Was this just another mathematical representation that did the same thing as the Schrodinger equation? Or was this the tip of the iceberg describing a totally new concept of our reality, of the universe? His pilot wave theory worked. It's just extremely complicated. Now, Bohm's physics, as we're going to move on with this, Bohm's physics now transcends, kind of transcends from physics to metaphysics. Metaphysics is an area of philosophy that deals with reality. So it's kind of physics, it's kind of metaphysics, more philosophy. Actually, Bohm's theory is really the only one that can explain particle entanglement. Another potential is time reversal. We won't go there because I don't believe it. To Bohm, the universe is composed of information, constantly folded and unfolded into what he describes as the explicate and implicate order. In entanglement, all particles exist in a higher order, another higher dimension. That's Bohm's term. A higher dimensional order, we could say a parallel universe. In that order, there is no space and time. So the two particles do not exist in our perceived world, the explicate order, until observed. They pop out of the implicate order into our world, the explicate order. They can be entangled because essentially they are next to each other in space when there's no space and time. And they pop into existence in our order. And they could be millions of light years apart in our order. This is how they remain entangled. Let me explain more of this change of information. To Bohm, this podium here, matter and consciousness are two different ways of representing the same thing. Let's discuss the implicate-explicate order. 
Um, for example, Kurt back there is wearing a red shirt. So I know that the light's coming down, it hits Kurt's shirt, it's coming to me in the you know, red visible wavelength, and that's transparent information to me so I know Kurt's wearing a red shirt. Right? So that information that we receive in the explicate order. According to Bohm, the photons coming off his shirt also contain information of the rest of the universe. We just cannot perceive it. That information is in the implicate order. We are information and energy. This infolding and unfolding information is continuous at a rapid pace, a very rapid pace, down what's called the Planck scale. Extremely fast. We exist, we don't exist. We exist, we exist. We're constantly going back and forth between the explicate and implicate order. Kind of really odd if you think about it. Bohm describes successive orders of this implicate information. The first is the super quantum order. That describes the movement of particles. That explains entanglement. At the next higher level order of information, information of matter and consciousness are the same thing. This podium and consciousness to Bohm are the same thing in a higher order, and essentially we'll call it a parallel universe. This is a picture of, not a very good one, but blown up. This is a picture of David Lohm and the Dalai Lama. They were very close. To Bohm, the entire universe is connected. This is very similar to Eastern philosophy. Is Bohm's theory correct? We don't know. We just don't know. Could we even test it? Maybe, maybe not. We may not be able to ever detect this other order if it even exists. It exists in another realm. Let's, let's move on. Another great physicist of the mid 20th century was John Wheeler of Princeton. Later in life, many physicists began to ponder the meaning of quantum mechanics. Rather than just using it as a tool, so Wheeler came up with the phrase, it from bit. To Wheeler, all things physical are information, theoretic in origin, and this is a participatory universe. Observer participants gives rise to information. I'm not gonna go into great details on that, but recall last week that conscious observation changes the wave particle duality and the principle, in this case with photon and electrons, matter that, of the universe. This is much like, say, the observer effect that we discussed last week. This is a picture of Wheeler. He's on your right, and with some other guy who needs a haircut. Wheeler was the last physicist to work with both Einstein and Niels Bohr. So it from bit, what he is saying it, this podium, material from bit, information. It from bit. To Wheeler, all matter is derived from information. Matter, it, bit, information. In computer parlance, a bit is the minimum unit of information. It's a zero or one, or a positive negative charge. We can consider information, knowledge, and consciousness to be the same for our discussions here. For Wheeler, this was a radical statement in the 1960s. It from bit. Matter from information. Has anyone else in human history ever made such a radical statement? How about Jesus? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. I read the statement from Jesus and his words, information is fundamental more than matter, more than matter of the universe, and information are connected. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Information. How about this from the Apostle John? The word became flesh. Now we all know this verse. The classic Christian interpretation of this phrase is the divine spirit became flesh in the form of Jesus. Matter. However, the Greek word logos, usually interpreted as word, can also mean universal knowledge. So this phrase can also be interpreted as 
universal knowledge became matter, again, in the form of Jesus. To Bohm, information is constantly folding and unfolding in the universe, also the basis of our material reality. Bohm's physics and the Dalai Lama philosophy were not that different. Consciousness underlies everything, and we are all connected within the universe. The increasing order of the entire universe, information, and energy. The universe is essentially energy, more so than Einstein's formula E equals mc squared. When you step on the scale in the morning, 99% of what you measure is energy. We ourselves are essentially physically energy. 99% of the mass in the atoms that we are made of are actually in the quarks that make up the protons and neutrons. And that mass is actually from the gluon, which is actually a good name for it, which is the energy that holds the quarks together. Our resting mass is energy. Of course, Lynn asked the question, if I'm made up of energy, why do I feel, don't feel energetic in the morning? You know, I think that's what coffee's for. So Wheeler's statement was radical in the 1960s, but less so today. In the last 25 years, an accepted theory of physics has evolved known as information theory or the cosmic hologram. It was conceived by Leonard Susskind at Stanford and Juan Maldacena of Argentina and de Kouf from uh, those Dutch physicists. They came up with this theory to counter Stephen Hawking when he said that information is lost in a black hole. Now there is agreement that information in the universe is conserved and is believed it exists in this mathematical boundary for lack of a better description of the universe. No longer such a radical statement. They are not yet stating that matter is created from information. They're not teaching that in physics classes yet. But there is an information realm that all matter is replicated in. Again, the best way to describe it. Wheeler's statement for a physicist is now less radical. Before the lecture, I suggest you, you watch the short video of Dr. Eben Alexander. Dr. Alexander was the neurosurgeon who had a near-death experience, and while in a coma for a week, he had what I describe as a very deep near-death experience, and he experienced God. Dr. Alexander was able to learn and experience much during his near-death experience. Again, he sensed God as love, pure love, and he also stated, on the subatomic level, however, this universe of separate objects turns out to be a complete illusion. Illusion, excuse me. In the realm of the super small, every object in the physical universe is ultimately connected with every other object. In fact, there are really no objects in the world at all, only vibrations of energy and relationships. Vibrations of energy is sort of like quantum field theory, which we will not get into. It's even more confusing. But Dr. Alexander describes God, footnote, he doesn't like the word God, he thinks it's inadequate, to describe, as he calls it, the center of all knowledge and energy of the universe. The it from bit, there it is again. God is the source of all knowledge and energy in our universe. Those who have had, again, what I would call a deep near-death experience, Universally, will describe either God, Jesus, or simply the divine being as looking at a thousand suns, but their eyes were not hurt. Pure energy. The other universal statement from in the ease is this sense of overwhelming love. In the other, the, one of the other videos we posted about Ian McCormick, he speaks of that life of love overtaking him, you know, after he's died. Universally, all deep NDE experiencers who experience the divine describe God as this intense light and overwhelming love, the center of all knowledge and energy in our universe. Let's take, I'm going to take a sidetrack briefly, a little footnote. Uh, we will get back to reality. When we think of God, we think of Genesis. We are created in God's image. So God created man in his own image. In our culture, that tends to be a grandfatherly image that Michelangelo painted on the Sistine Chapel. Eh, maybe, maybe not. According to Lorna Byrne, now, for those not familiar with her books, Lorna Byrne is described as a mystic. 
I would like her to a modern day prophet with a message God wants us to hear. Miss Byrne is about my age. She was born dyslexic. She can't read or write. Her parents thought she was mentally retarded as a child. She grew up in a poor Catholic neighborhood in Ireland. However, since childhood, she has seen angels. They were her playmates as a child. In this room, she would see that each one of you all has a guardian angel. To her, the room is filled with angels. You and I can't see them. She can't. If you truly want to understand the universe in reality, read her simple books. Forget quantum mechanics or information theory. It's just far too complicated. Angels have told her to write these books. And with modern day speech recognition software, she's been able to do this. On some occasions, she has actually met the angel Gabriel or Michael, and her soul on occasion has been transported to the other realm, much like a near-death experience. Another footnote, in one episode, she describes when Gabriel takes her soul to the other realm, time does not exist there, and she witnesses the passion of Christ in real time. For her, it's a very difficult thing to write. It's a very difficult thing to read about also. I would describe her as a modern day Saul. She has equivalent interactions with angels and God, but back to God as the center of the universe. Dr. Alexander describes God, the divine, as the center of all knowledge and energy of our universe. Lauren Byrne describes God again as this immense energy. She says that God takes a small piece of his energy and this becomes the soul of each of us. That is when we are born, we have a small amount of God, his energy within us, our soul. She actually sees energy coming out of matter. We are created in God's image. His energy resides in us. It's our soul. We are connected to God, not like Michelangelo's image, but through his energy. Let's look at this biblically for us real quickly. In Exodus when God appears to Moses, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Energy. When he was guiding the Israelites through the desert to guide them on their way by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. Energy. For what appeared to be his waist down, this is from Ezekiel, he was like fire and from there up his appearance was as bright as glowing metal. Energy. In John, in him was life, and that life was the light of men, or the world in this case. Energy. I am the light of the world. Energy. In, uh, where are we now? Matthew. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his, and his clothes became as white as light. Energy. In Luke... Uh, where a, a woman is seeking healing and she touches the back of the cloak of Jesus. Jesus says, someone touch me. I know that power has gone out of me. Actually, the Greek word for interpreted as power, um, the Greek word I can't pronounce, I won't even try it, but it means miraculous power. It's the same root that we get the word dynamite from. And in Acts, when the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Energy. And finally, just for information, the burial cloth of Jesus, the Shroud of Turin. In the 1980s, a group of scientists and artists examined the cloth. No one can explain the existence of the images on the shroud. The only possible explanation? Extremely intense light. The Shekinah glory. Energy. We are created in God's image. It's his energy. All right. So that was a long footnote. Let's get back to our discussion on reality. Finally, let's explore one more concept of reality. This is more a recent concept from another Nobel physicist, Roger Penrose. Penrose writes about the concept that began with the dualistic approach. So I recall from our last lecture that Descartes instituted the concept of duality. Body, that is the body of the universe, not just our physical body. In Descartes' time, the soul and mind were considered to be the same thing. Now Penrose adds a third realm, which he calls Platonic after Plato. 
This is a realm that science cannot address or study the way we do science now. We credit Descartes with the concept of dualism. However, Plato, 350 years before Christ, also described a dualistic world with the soul conscious separate from the body. Plato added a third realm, which he called forms. Forms are an element of the universe that govern it. An example of this would be a perfect square back then to them. Um, they saw a square, but they never saw one with exactly the same size and exactly 90.00 degrees. Beauty would also have been a form. For us, the concept of infinity would be a platonic form. We understand it, but we've never experienced it. Well, there have been a few sermons in which we felt we were experiencing it, but that doesn't count. Penrose names this after Plato, but he hypothesizes that this other realm of the universe is pure mathematics, a pure math that governs the universe, a realm that science as we know it and practice it cannot access. In his most recent book, Penrose describes consciousness in a similar vein. We cannot describe it or access it through science, but he feels if we conduct science differently, perhaps we can for, the, for both the realm, other realm, and consciousness. Some philosophers, which I would agree with, state that math is just a form of language we humans have created to describe the universe. It's just, it's just another language. Right? So, so in Penrose's hypothesis here, rather than dualism, we have trilateralism the body, the physical universe, the mind, consciousness, or I would say soul, and the pure mathematical realm that governs it all. I kind of like this trilateral approach, but it can be viewed differently, at least my way of viewing reality. In this drawing, the form that governs the universe is God. So you'll notice that I graphically have expanded God's circle and his realm to now encapsulate the entire universe the physical and the spiritual. We have a body, the universe. We have our mind, our soul, and God. It connects everything. Now all realms are interconnected by what I referred to in my last lecture as God's consciousness field. This covers everything. The body of the universe is what's right here. The body of the universe is what science is limited to studying in the laboratory. Consciousness or soul and God go beyond the laboratory into human experience. Scientists don't like the concept of non-local consciousness, nor the fact that consciousness can affect matter. When we discuss these, we actually leave the realm of what can be tested in a laboratory, the limits of science. So this, you know, you know in your laboratory, science basically can test what we perceive in our universe. That's the limit of what they can do. Consciousness and God now go beyond that. Once we get out of the physical limits of the laboratory, we're now in the realm of theology and philosophy. Scientists don't like that. We're not, we are not going to gain a greater understanding of reality by building a bigger, more powerful particle accelerator. It will come from human experience. We will gain knowledge from near-death experiences, mystics, or mediums. As we discussed last week, near-death experiences are our telescopes into this other realm. People come back and they tell us about that other realm. They, we should study them because they, again, are our telescopes into that realm, a realm we can't deal with in a laboratory. One way to express this is actually similar to the Hindu concept of Brahma. Brahma encapsulates the entire universe, every living and physical thing. Everything is connected. Our God reaches everything. God is the center of all knowledge and energy of the universe. In our Christian sense, we have the physical body, we have our consciousness, our soul, and we have God. So we can think of this as Father, Son, Holy Ghost. 
To Bone Wheeler, reality is knowledge. The universe is information. It's composed of energy. To Dalai Lama and many other scientists, consciousness underlies the universe. We are all connected. Now we can understand that. God is the center of all knowledge and energy of the universe. God is both the creator and curator of the universe. When we sing the song, we have an awesome God, we really do have an awesome God. Now, hopefully these lectures have given you some appreciation how awesome our God really is. The creator and curator of the universe and us. Thank you.